Good morning. Today is Sunday, April 16th, 2023. I'd be interested if anybody knows a man whose name was Harry Coover. Now, Harry Coover is a person that's quite important in the lives of many of us because he invented superglue. Where would we be without superglue? Now, what's interesting is that the product superglue was originally called Eastman 910. In 1951, Harry Coover was working at a lab at Eastman Kodak. And he was testing compounds to use to coat jet engines. And they needed to be able to coat the jet engines in a way, <clears throat> excuse me, in a way that allowed the most light to be reflected because it needed to be bright in the sky. And so the way they would test it is they would take two lenses, two clear glass lenses, and they would put the compound in between the two clear lenses, and then they would test how much light came through. They tried 909 different compounds, and none of them were satisfactory until they got to compound number 910. Compound 910, which again is supposed to allow the most light to uh, pass between these two lenses, when they put that between the two lenses, they found they couldn't separate the lenses. They were stuck together. No matter what they did, they couldn't separate them. And Coover thought that he had broken the equipment, that he was in big trouble. And that was the origin of superglue. This product, this substance, originally called 910, it was the 910th try, didn't work for what they wanted it to work for, but it has become ubiquitous in our lives. Who can live without a little superglue super at the right moment? All because of Harry Coover. Now it's interesting, that was in 1951, it's interesting that in 1968, Spencer Silver had the opposite problem. He was a researcher working for 3M Corporation, and he was trying to formulate glue. 3M makes all sorts of tapes and glues. And he was trying to formulate a glue, and he made something that was too weak. You could just pull it right off. What good is that for glue? It was a failure. Until a few years later, when someone realized, you know, there could be a benefit to a weak glue, and created post-it notes. Weak glue where you can put it on, but you could take it off, but you could put it back on. There's a benefit to what would appear initially to be a failure, it's actually an amazing product. Post-it notes. The lesson of these examples and so, so many others is that we are reluctant to learn from our mistakes. But the truth is, our mistakes can be our best teachers Our mistakes can give us our most valuable lessons if only we let them. But we resist. We become defensive. We don't want to take responsibility for failure. It is so hard to receive even constructive criticism. And it is even hard And it is even harder to offer it so that it is seen by the listener as supportive. One of the famous classic medieval Jewish philosophers, 
Shlomo ben Gavriel wrote, My friend is he who tells me my faults in private. So hard to get it right. We come to this week's Torah portion. It's the double Parsha Tazriya Mitzorah. And it's hard not to roll your eyes as you read this week's Parsha. It's about spots appearing on the skin, hairs turning different colors. I mean, it is just plain weird. Now, our sages explain that these discolorations are not leprosy, as is often translated, but it is the spiritual sin of speaking Lashon Hara. A person would speak Lashon Hara, say negative things about another person. They would be afflicted by tsaras, some discoloration, on their skin, in the hair, on their clothing, even on the walls of a house, and that is what is being discussed in this double portion this week. But (laughs) it is still really weird. And as you read it, if it turns this color and that color, and what happens and how do you deal with it, and if it's a problem, what are the consequences and how do you get over the consequences? But the Rambam explains, Maimonides explains, that this, what appears to be uh, to us to be such a weird, bizarre occurrence, was the most amazing, divine kindness from God. It was a system of ongoing, constructive criticism that God Himself would offer to every single individual. In a sense, a sort of prophecy, but not limited just to the great prophets who had achieved such high spiritual levels, but a a message that would be given to every single individual as needed. When a person would contract saras, and it doesn't apply to us because we no longer live within the era of prophecy. But during this time, when this would occur to a person, it was God giving us a loving message. And the message was, my dear child, be careful how you speak. You may not have even realized it, but your words the other day, they caused pain. Your words separated one person and another by causing a disharmony. You need to be more careful so you don't cause harm again. That's the message of Tsaras, that God is willing and wants to give each individual this message. And the truth of the matter is, as bizarre as our Torah portion seems to us when we learn it, the truth is we are impoverished not to have tzara'as today. Can you imagine what the world would be like if we did get some kind of a feedback on our words, if we did get feedback that maybe we had said something insensitive, maybe we had hurt someone's feelings even without realizing it, and that we were convinced that the feedback that we were receiving was from one who loves us, one who is not jealous of us, one who only wants what is best for us, one who is God, I once saw on Facebook, many folks want to serve God, but only as advisors. Imagine if we could serve God by letting God lift us up, by letting God improve us, by letting God setting us straight. And that is what happened during the era when Tsara'as was a reality. 
Okay. But we do not have that feedback today. This is a, a consequence of the period of time we have lived in since the destruction of the temple, Hester Panim, where God appears to hide his face from us. We do not receive these clear messages. We don't receive clear messages from prophets. We don't receive clear messages directed to us in the form of Tsaras. So we only have each other. And it is so hard to say the right thing. And it is so hard to hear it in the right way, to take it in the way that it's intended, and to use it to improve ourselves. But we have to try. And then we have to try harder. Because it is possible. With forethought and judgment, with a close relationship established in advance with choosing exactly the right moment and the right words, it is possible to be able to say something to another person that they will perceive as constructive and loving and want you to say this to them so that they can improve themselves. It's possible. George Crumb was a chef in a restaurant near Saratoga, New York, in 1853. And when he was the chef at this restaurant, there was a customer who would come on a regular basis about once a week. And every time this customer came, he ordered fried potatoes together with his meal. And every time this customer sent them back to the kitchen, complaining they were soggy. Imagine how irritating that is for the chef. Every week, the same customer sends the, the dish back. It's soggy. So one day, Chef Crumb cuts the potatoes as thin as possible, almost like paper, and he purposefully overcooks them in order to insult this irritating customer. And instead of French fried potatoes, they came out crisp and crunchy and the customer loved them. And that is how George Crumb invented potato chips. My friends, I want to wish you a great day, and I look forward to seeing you soon in person.